when we, when they talk about inflation, to give it a lot of airtime, which they are doing in the media, but not talking about the impact to people, to not to have it as part of the curriculum and to say this is inflation or this, but to not talk about, um, you know, how inflation compounds and on the back end, the impact of that compounding can wreck you, or how do you defend or how do you defend and protect yourself against inflation with the money that you earn and how you, your choices you make? I think that's doing a disservice. All right, so welcome back to another episode of Bitcoin versus the banks. And I'm joined here by two fellows. Uh, we've got Mark Mulder and we've got Anthony. I try not to say this in too snooty of a way. The Gazon. How are Perfect. you guys? I'm Great. well. Thanks for having us. Good to be here. It's awesome. My, my pleasure. You know, uh, having fellow educators on is is always a pleasure. I was lucky enough to get uh, Jason Mayer on here. Um, I think the more teachers that we can bring into the space, the better. Um, <clears throat> having gone to the Canadian Bitcoin conference, I spoke to Greg Foss shortly thereafter, and he told me um, that I was one of, I think it was three or four other teachers there. And I know that doesn't sound like a big number, but when you're talking about a conference that had about two to 300 people, like, one percent roughly like that's that's pretty darn good especially for you know an occupation where people tend to be more on the left-leaning side and probably you know frankly don't think too much about money because uh you know if you're working in a public board your money just gets invested anyways so you're kind of not thinking about it too much so the fact that people like you know us are in the space or learning about you know freedom technology and sound money uh gives me hope so yeah i want to thank you guys for being here so much that's great Appreciate it. thank you us. Uh, so, you know, for people that may not know you guys, uh, Mark, why don't we start with you? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and sort of what brought you into Bitcoin? And then uh, we'll just pass it right off to Anthony. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, so my name is Mark Mulder. I'm a teacher. I work on a board outside of Toronto. I teach grade eight. I'm a father. Uh, I've got two young boys and I'm also a real estate investor. And as I got into the world of real estate investing, realizing that my income and the pension that you had mentioned wouldn't be enough to take care of myself and my family in the future. I delved into the world or the history of money. I was always intrigued with how money is created. And I think it was actually, uh, what well, was, I know for a fact, it was 2019, uh, 2020, where I did a deep dive into the history of money. And I came across Seyfedeen's Amus books, The Bitcoin Standard, which a lot of us kind of got into. The first 70, 80 pages did a fantastic overview of the history of money. What is money? What constitutes money? And from there, I started listening to podcasts and individuals like Greg Foss and other podcasts where they're talking about Bitcoin. And that's where I, I, I went down the proverbial uh, rabbit hole. And uh, for the past three, four years, it's been all Bitcoin, or at least spending a lot of time talking to fellow Bitcoiners, reading, listening to podcasts, and probably invested hundreds of hours at this point in Bitcoin. So that's how I got started. And still just scratching the surface, learning a tremendous amount. And again, like as you know, and Anthony, as you know, it's a fantastic community. And it was also at that Bitcoin conference in June. So it was the second teacher the FOSS talked to. I connected <laughs> with him as well. So there's two. That's two of the four. That's 50%. Awesome. There you go. That's perfect. There might there might have been some hidden ones there that didn't say. So you yeah, <laughs> you guys might have been the majority, eh? Um, okay, so I'm Anthony Diazon. Uh, thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Um, my background is uh, I uh, was in in IT at IBM and in banking for a number of years. Um, more on the back back end from an IT product management support stuff that sort of thing. Um, Back in about 2005, left the corporate world and uh, joined my wife in her music school. So we start we run music schools across the GTA. And uh, similar to my, Mark's point around the pension issue is I left my pension behind when I left the corporate world behind. And so um, I think it was about 2000 and 2013, we went, okay, we've got to do something. And that's when we start to dig into, you know, how do we... How do we provide for our own pension through hard assets, real estate? And then that trickled into gold and under, learning about Jim Rickards and the case for gold and why gold might be a thing to consider in terms of its attributes as being hard, sound money. Um, that was the exact same time that I got introduced to Bitcoin by my son one Christmas at that first 20,000 or so high. And um, I did definitely not even think about it. And uh, just really poo-pooed it, my, you know, like the smart dad to the young son, right? Definitely wrong in that regard. 
but I was, I'm glad that I did actually have that exposure to gold and what made that good. Because when I was reintroduced to uh, Bitcoin, same time as you, Mark, in 2020, um, that made the leap so easy because once I took a look at the attributes of Bitcoin and what it did and why it made for good sound money and kind of looked at it from a technology standpoint, I, I meant, man, that was, I don't know why I didn't think about it a few years. If I just looked and just read something, <laughs> you know, if I did, Safe's book was out for years before we got it, right? So if, and started reading it. Um, so if we had just done a little bit of that research then and left my mind a little bit open, uh, I'm sure we would have been into Bitcoin even earlier than 2020. I've actually been in there since pretty much the same time. Um, I want to say it was sort of probably around the COVID lockdowns, actually. Um, started investing some money and uh, I, don't, I, don't, I may have put a little bit into Bitcoin. I also probably bought a little bit of Ethereum. I'm not really understanding what I was getting myself into. Um, but the reason I bring this up is because I, I think there's a lot of people out there in the space, nam namely the, like the podcasting space, people that have probably been it far longer than I have. And um, I guess it's easy for like listeners to sort of almost assume that like these guys have been in it for, you know, five, six, seven, eight years, whatever the, the time span is. So it's like th they've already made a killing off of Bitcoin. So it's almost like they have nothing to lose at this point. Whereas like, I, you know, people like us that have really only been around for a few years that have probably bought near the top, if not the top, and have kind of worked our way down. Um, we're in a very different boat uh, financially. Um, I mean, I, I don't know what your other investments look like. Uh, that's obviously private information. Uh, but the point being is like, we we got into it um, at, at a much higher price. And we've been buying probably all, all of us uh, all the mm -hmm. way down. Um, and so like, you know, we obviously have conviction in it for, for a good reason. Uh, it, rather than something that we bought when it was, you know, $5, $100, whatever it is. So I just want to make that point uh, clear to people that not everybody gets in at the same time. And uh, there's that you know famous saying, right? Uh, you get Bitcoin at the price you deserve. So if you're buying it at, you know, 20, 26, 30, sounds like a lot of money. Uh, it sounds like you, you kind of missed the boat. But, uh, you know, if you really understand this thing, you know, it's just going to keep going at some point. So, yeah. yeah. And just to add to that, back in 2015, 16, my wife had actually mentioned, hey, there's this thing called Bitcoin. One of my coworkers is talking about it. We should buy it. And I just brushed it off. I'm like, this is ridiculous. What is this Bitcoin thing? And at the same time, like all the uh, exchanges were being hacked and all the money was being stolen and, and, and the cryptos. So again, even if you had invested in 2016, 15, 16, 17, chances are like your money might be locked up in one of those exchanges or may have disappeared as well. So yeah, it may have been $5,000, whatever the price was at that point. But you have access to it. Like we don't have, you know, that they didn't have the technology that we have today. At least it wasn't accessible to most of us, right? Mm. So just an, you know, something to add yeah, to that. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah, there's definitely people that have uh, lost that over the years. Um, so you know, as a teacher, um, one of the things you, we do hear about every now and then is this thing called financial literacy, and uh, it sounds like a sort of obvious thing to people, but let's just kind of clear that up. Um, Anthony, why don't we start with you? Like, how do you define those words, financial literacy? Yeah, really, I I think it's I think of it like this. It's the um, it's having the understanding around uh, what the truth about money is, and um, with that understanding, then being able to apply it in real life to understand um, how to make good or sound financial decisions. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff that breaks down under that under that. But um, if you can understand those two things, the truth about money, and then learning how to apply it to make good financial decisions for yourself and your family. I think if you if that's covered off, then you, you would be you would be actually quite financially literate. Mark, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I I mean I agree with what Anthony said. I think the important thing is, especially teaching in schools and as a teacher, the curriculum is there. It is in the curriculum. For example, I teach grade eight, and I know that the ministry expectations are understand what debt is, understand what credit is, and to make a budget so that you can live within your means and, and you know factor in expenses and taxes. But what resonates with me or what, what catches my attention is that a lot of that is, is within the banking ecosystem, 
is within the traditional banking ecosystem. So part of financial literacy is understanding that the bank can and have in the past, for, like they can freeze assets. We know many examples of where that has occurred. And also just understanding what money is and how money's created. And I think it's important, like if you're 14, 15, 16, or just graduating from high school, going into university, or as an adult, you need to understand the way the system is designed, the fact that our, we're taxed at source, and then whatever you're allowed to keep after you pay the government, it's debased through, the, through deficit spending, through the printing of more money. So I think that's a really key point. And I, and I think these are the things that are not talked about as, as often either in mainstream media or definitely in the classroom that, hey, you got to pay taxes. But then even if you were to hold that money in an investment that's producing four, five, 6%, or even, hey, keeping up with the S&P 500, which is only keeping pace with the production of money, M2 money supply, you're not getting ahead. So you have to be aware of that. Now, what tools do you use? Afterwards, that's where you can delve into in, into you know the, the the world of of financial planning. But at least have a basic understanding, be financially literate to understand what is happening to the money in your pocket, which represents your time and energy. So and the, the thing for yeah, us, ahead, is that we get that. Yeah, sorry. The, and and the urgency for us as dads, I'm a father of three kids in their twenties, right? Um, the urgency for us as dads is to one, have our kids understand those truths, but the magic happens when that understanding doesn't take, you know, 20 or 30 years to get cleared up in your mind like it has for me and um, a bit for Mark, but sounds like a bit for you as well, me right? Me too, yeah. And so that's that's the gift that we're trying to give to our kids. And then by extension to the, you know, the programs that we're, we're running and, and building as we're talking about right now. So that kids have that understanding, yeah. but not late, early, so that it can inform their lives and it can benefit their lives, um, you know, from the early age and formative stages and it's the decisions they make. And, 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 yeah, and that, sorry, go ahead. And so just to add to that as well, like inflation, this is a foreign term for us. It's happening in most of the world outside of Western Europe and North America. But if like, this is something that's a new word in the Canadian vocabulary, like the English vocabulary in, in Canada, inflation and deflation and these concepts. Have you gone to the grocery store? Like this happens all the time or has been happening in other countries, Argentina, Venezuela, uh, Lebanon, like Weimar, Germany. But like we, as Anthony said, is we want kids, like I want my kids to understand this. I'll give you an example. Uh, we just did a big road trip down to Florida last week and we were listening to a few podcasts. And my, one of my two boys, one of them is nine. Immediately, like just because I've been surrounding him with these concepts and talking to them about it. He's like, yeah. So the government is basically taxing you and then debasing your money. And then because your money's worth less, and these are his words, the prices are going up and he's nine years old. So as dads, as wow. Anthony said, this is what we're trying to teach the kids. And this is what the kids have to understand. We feel, I feel that the kids need to understand how the system is designed so that they can make smart financial decisions. But not discover this when the 35 years old and turn around is like, wow, I can barely afford rent. Why are the groceries going up? Which is happening to us today. I'm impressed that at that age, he's that interested and he's, he's understanding these concepts. I think that's amazing. Um, you know, I think for me, a big part of it is like kids and grownups for that matter, just don't really understand what money is just sort of at like a base level, sort of first principles you know, where the way I envision it, it's, it's essentially a token for a person's time and energy, right? Whatever you put into it, you get something. It's almost like a, a coupon saying, you know, you work for this many hours and in the future, you can kind of cash that in for whatever service or product you want to use it for. And I think when people really understand that, then they begin to make those wise decisions, you know, to say like, you know what, is this valuable enough for like, you know, I've, I put in five hours of work at McDonald's uh, I want to go blow it on some, you know, one pair of jeans or whatever. Does that make sense? Well, not really. If I understand that all of that energy went into it, maybe I should hold that and, you know, use uh, use that money for something a little bit better. Um, yeah, the, the fact that he's nine years old and into that, that's amazing. So that speaks volumes as far as like what you're doing as a parent and, and you know, also about just his character. I mean, at that age, I don't think I would have cared at all. So yeah, good on him. Um, I'm curious, like, how would you guys rate, Mark, maybe I'll start with you, like, if you had to score from one to 10, 10 being the highest, 
you know, somebody's understanding of financial literacy and we're going to maybe put your son aside here, just as, as a general, what would you say about those grade sevens and eights? Do they have financial I, literacy? I don't think it's high enough. I think we can do a lot better. I think there's fantastic teachers working in the system that are trying to help the kids. Um, but the reality is there's so much to cover in the math curriculum alone, let alone everything else that's expected, that it's tough. Like if you plug in two weeks in May or June to talk about financial literacy and talk about debt and credit cards and loyalty programs, okay, you know, kids might pay attention. But I think I will tell you that although the financial literacy is not high enough, at least I feel that way, we, we, anecdotally. I think kids have a tremendous interest in financial literacy if you can engage them and if you make it about them. Because kids do know that they need money. They need money to buy things, to buy nice things, to live in nice homes, to buy cool cars and cool things and iPhones, et cetera, to go out and have fun with their friends. So if you can hook them that way and talk to them during class, hey, we're doing math, but let's quickly, we're doing calc you know, percents right now and pull up, for example, the S&P 500. Okay, what stock do you like over there? Okay, let's look at the Starbucks stock. Boom. Oh my God, this is a bar chart. This is what a bar chart looks like. Red, green, red is prices going up. Uh, gr sorry, green price is going up, red, the price is going down. Let's look at the, you know, the price action today. And you teach them those things, they start talking about it. So there is a tremendous appetite from what I'm seeing from the kids in my class and, and it, talking to them in stocks, in Bitcoin, in budgeting, because I've done all of these things that, with my students in the class and they love it and they talk to me about it and they talk about Bitcoin and they ask me about it. So are we doing enough? No. Are the kids interested? If you can engage them, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if I had to come to a conclusion, I would say the same thing. Um, I taught grade four and five last year and we did a variety of things. Uh, one of which was like trying to figure out like if somebody made this much money, you know, this is their marginal tax rate, how much tax would get deducted and how much they'd have left over. Um, and they found that kind of thing pretty interesting. And of course we got into a debate about like, you know, who should pay more taxes? Should everybody pay the same amount of taxes? And that made for like a really lively discussion and one where like people can kind of think critically about these things. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, is it fair? What, what is more fair? So that's sort of like, uh, that piece I thought was really fascinating. And I agree, like the kids were totally into that. Um, and we did talk about uh, the stock market as well. And clearly, you know, there's some companies they know really well. And then others that like, you know, just over time as they become adults, they'll kind of begin to understand a little bit more. Um, Anthony, what do you think? Like, what do kids know? Do they, do they know a lot? <laughs> Yeah, I like clearly the, the the ability for kids to understand concepts um, is absolutely there at whatever level, right? You just need to make it relevant to them. Mm -hmm. I think on some levels, um, the media and, and, and the academics that get a lot of airtime try to make things seem way more complicated and focus on um, focus on issues that don't help kids don't help people and kids in particular, as we're talking about it for who we're serving, right? It, it doesn't help them understand relevant points. So to connect a couple of dots that have been talked about already, um, Mark's talking about inflation and you've e effectively talked about uh, receipts for the work that you, for the effort you've done, money, right? And when, we, when they talk about inflation, to give it a lot of airtime, which you are doing in the media, but not talking about the impact to people, to not to have it as part of the curriculum and to say this is inflation or this, but to not talk about um, you know, how inflation compounds and on the back end, the impact of that compounding can wreck you. Or how do you defend or how do you defend and protect yourself against inflation with the money that you earn and how you, your choices you make? I think that's doing a disservice because it's like that's not important to know. Um like that's not life changing. Like it doesn't matter for you to make choices that can be better for your family. And in fact, better for the economy, the more money you make, the more financially secure you are, the more you are free to, to not just spend on the essentials, but on other things and experience, right? So I think that's where some of the misses, the miss is happening. And it's not just at the public school system or a high school system, or the undergraduate level or the graduate level. You know, I took, I took business economic finance courses and at the undergraduate and at the graduate level and they do talk about things and they do not talk about other things so i didn't learn any of this under at undergrad in my undergrad or in my mba i didn't i did not learn it and 
it needs to be taught so that these things can be put into context and that we can appreciate the impact for imp for inflation. And it's some simple things too, but what does it mean now that there's inflation? I'm curious, uh, in, in university or college, what, what did they teach you about inflation that 2% is just sort of to be expected? It's not, it, yeah, it would, it would be something that is a given. So it'll just say that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to go back right now, like 20 years, 30 years, my undergrad, 20 years, 25 years to my MBA. It would not have been anything that would have been uh, a question. They wouldn't say, okay, this is our target rate inflation, in, inflation. Um, uh, is this a good thing or a bad thing? It would just say, this is what it was. You know, Ben Bernanke, he, you know, former chair, uh, you know, he wrote my economics book in my undergrad. So I was pretty happy to see him come in. And so it's like, it never comes up. It never, it was never a thing to think about it. Um, and that's, it's kind of, it's a little bit embarrassing that, you know, even I wasn't taught critically to think enough to ask, why does this happen? You know, it's that's and that's part of what we're trying to do, not just to not just to share different facts, but to say, hey, guys, think about what does this mean? And how do you look at that? How do you hear media messages? Right. That's a skill that is necessary to understand, to to apply to things that are so critical and important in your life. And money is it, it is actually important. It's, it, it fuels so much. So I. I... I feel like people out there assume that teachers, whether it's elementary, middle school, high school, that they're not teaching children to think critically. And I, I mean, I disagree with that. I may, I mean, that may be true of some teachers, but I think the vast majority of us do push for it and give students opportunities to do so. Somewhere along the way, I think either we forget to do it or we're distracted or something because I, I know I've learned how to think critically, especially like in university, I was kind of forced to do it through my studies. But I never really applied it. Like if a, if a professor said something to me, I almost just, you know, uh, assumed it was the truth, right? Is this, this person standing up there is the arbiter of truth. And I don't know why it's like, really, I should have said like, you know, why are you saying this? Or like, where are these conclusions coming from? And I never really did that. And yet, like I, I came out of university thinking that I am this critical thinker. I, I really understand the world. Um, I think, you know, for a long time, I've been able to do that, but I just... I forget to or, or what it is. And so I think like as teachers and, and parents too, for that matter, uh, we need to just remind our, you know, our kids to do it uh, and to be asking the right questions. Because I think most of what critical thinking is, is that sort of quote unquote, looking outside the box. It's like what things aren't being said and why, um, you know, this narrative that inflation is necessary, that we have to hit that target of 2%. Like, it makes no sense, at least to the people like ourselves who advocate for sound money, because I think it was Avik Roy uh, who said that 2% is this like nefarious uh, number or target that they aim for, because as you said, it, it compounds and it doesn't take that long before you lose that purchasing power. Um, so I, I think we can agree that like, it's not just kids that are lacking financial literacy, it is grownups as well. Uh, so Mark, do you have any sort of experiences personally or people that you know of that you can say, yeah, financial literacy among, you know, 18 year olds or older, it's kind of lacking it too. Absolutely. Like anecdotally, just this past year in, in February and April, when we ran our financial literacy course, we, we obviously marketed it to the kids, but in doing so, a lot of the parents sheepishly asked us, Hey, like, is there an adult version of this? Or I should really sit in on this course. Can I? Um, so I think the reality is parents are busy. We're all busy. We're running for, we're working full time. We've got our nine to five job. We've got our families. We've got all the responsibilities at home and we're trying to improve ourselves as well. So at the end of the day, you would hope in the system that works where you have sound money that you put the effort in the energy. And then, as you had mentioned before, like your money is actually it, like, think of your money as like a store of value. The value is there. It should remain. As we talked about, inflation is very quickly eroding our, our time and energy that's been stored in money. But families, like adults just don't have time or many adults do not have time to investigate and to spend the time reading books, learning about macroeconomics, learning about the history of money. They may not be interested. So it's very difficult. I also think that the banking system does a phenomenal job marketing 
And that's the message. Hey, invest in a mutual fund. RSPs are important. Lock it up. Governments have full control over it. And then they decide when you can withdraw it and what percentage of tax you pay and how much you get to withdraw when you're 69 or 68. And then you have to roll it into another uh, product or just invest in, you know, GIC is 5%, not realizing that inflation is ripping at, you know, officially seven, six, 5%, but housing prices and groceries are going up astronomically. So how do you keep up? It's tough. Um, and then of course you hear from mainstream media, oh, Bitcoin, bad, dangerous, a lot of risk. For sure. If you're investing there is risk, but if you're, if, you know, if you're investing for the long term and you have conviction, you know, there's hope. Understanding what money is and what it represents. So yeah, I do think that there, it's financial literacy. It's also missing in uh, older individuals as well. Anthony, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I had, I've had neighbors, um, uh, you know, neighbors of people who are, you know, high level executives in banking or, you know executives in, in, in big companies that they own and spouses come knocking on my door or messaging me in social media saying, Hey, we need, we would, you know, can we have this for us too? Um, there, you know, it's enough. It's enough trying to understand what we're told to try and understand what we're told is important to focus on. And I think part of that's, we're trained to do that. Well, you know, if you go, if you succeed in high school, if you succeed in undergrad or graduate school, you know, postgrad, if you succeed in that, some a lot of the, the training is to to understand what you're being told, to memorize it, and to, and to give it back. Understand what you're told, memorize it, and give it back, and give it back accur accurately. The same way you got it, return it in the same way. And so that's a skill that those who do well in school um, have honed and refined. And so that doesn't serve us so well when we, um, it doesn't serve us so well when we are faced with a new op, a new problem because we haven't learned to say, what's what's the alternate alternative media source? What are the alternative economic um, models or theories? What are, what are different ways to look at money? Is all money just paper money? Is that the only kind of money there is? Um, why did, look at history? What happened across history when we're looking at gold or generations or, you know, uh, cultures or, you know, civilizations? What, what happened through there? There are things that, you know, if you studied history, you would see things. If you looked at it a slightly different level, what happened to, to all, to every culture? What's happened to every country's, you know, dollars or fiat whatever you call the you know the mark or the rule whatever it's always happened the same way that over time as you add a little bit of inflation to reduce the purchasing power of the money that we're working for or saving our life force energy in it over time it just keeps uh, seeping away the battery keeps draining out draining out draining out so if you put it away when you go back to get it it just doesn't seem, to, it just not doesn't seem, it doesn't have the same force, power, value, purchasing power, value to buy the thing in the future. And so I actually believe that is shaping some of the ways that our kids and adults are behaving. Like it's, and it's might even be, I think it's on a some, somewhat a sublim subliminal level, right? If you think, for example, Metaphor, if you think that you can put some type of perishable food out on the counter and leave it there and come and get it in two weeks without trying to do something to keep it from spoiling or to keep it so that its nutrient value is still there, you have to do something. We have learned that, you know, you can't do that. Put it in the fridge, put it in the freezer. We have learned that because of experience. I think we might have learned that with money too. And we see it in our behaviors where people, and it's younger people too, right? We're battling it with our kids. I'm battling with my older kids just where you're saying, hey guys, save your money. Don't just spend it, save it for the future. But there's something that's happening where they're going, man, maybe I shouldn't save it because, you know, what am I going to buy with it later? Let me spend it as fast as I can, right? And history says that people do that. You know, when the money loses its value, they spend it as hard as they can, as fast, as quickly as they can. And if there's something else, some other kind of money that doesn't lose its value, then they save that, but they spend the other kind of money as fast as they can. 
And so part of the education is what are the characteristics of money? What loses, what kind of money doesn't lose its value? Where can I, are, is there anything that's like that? Where can we put and save our money in these different types of things? And sometimes it's real estate that we've been told. Some people think it's precious metals, gold or silver. Some people are thinking now it's Bitcoin. And why, why is it that we should think that way? We need, to under, we need to look at that and explore that and, and talk about it and help people think and understand a different way of possibly saving, you know, different tools to save for the future. Yeah. I, and, and just to get, sorry, Milan, just to get back to that question about financial literacy for adults, I think as well, let's face it, like the game is changing real time. So as we're going off to work and earning that money, we we don't have the purchasing power that we had a generation ago. Like my parents' generation, uh, the expectation was if you got a university degree, you're set for life. Uh, you work hard at a job. You'll be able to purchase a home in Toronto. In fact, you're going to live in a five-bedroom home with a pool, perhaps, and one salary in Toronto. You know, 20 years ago, you could still afford a house in Toronto. As a teacher, you could certainly afford a house in a place like Oakville, five bedrooms with a swimming pool, fully detached on a teacher salary. The reality is that teachers coming into the profession today, if they can get a full-time job and qualify for a mortgage based on their income, they're not going to be living anywhere near Oakville or Mississauga, let alone Toronto. If they think of starting a family, they're going to be maybe purchasing a condo or townhome. Again, every situation is unique, but if they have no financial support from family or relatives or, or you know, friends, they're going to be perhaps renting in Hamilton or purchasing a small town home out in, in Stony Creek. So I think it's changing real time, really to get back to your question, like it's changing real time. And, and we don't realize that this inflation is ripping and destroying and debasing our dollar, which represents time and energy. So for myself personally, speaking from experience, yeah, I'm a teacher, but I've got to do side hustles. I've got to risk my money, get into real estate, be a landlord. I fixed the dryer last night and dropped it off in Hamilton. I've, I'm a, I've run a tutoring business as well. So I do marketing and Facebook marketing for that. And I work with students one-on-one -on -one in math and language and trying to scale that up. I've got to get into Bitcoin. I was looking for the side hustle. My wife works full-time as well, just trying to keep up because the dollar's being destroyed. So just wanted to add that. Yeah, I mean, I'm very much on board with that, like, or I can relate to that. You know, I don't know how many side hustles I've had over the last couple of years. Uh, I just started another one recently. So, and I mean, this podcast happens to be another one. I mean, at this point, it's not really making me any money. Who knows where it'll take me? But, but the point is, like, we're all in the same boat where, like, just every single day or every single year, we feel like we're just falling farther and farther behind. And it's that that nefarious inflation, whether it's 2% or 5%, it just keeps eating away our money. And, you know, unless we're fortunate enough to have all these assets already that um, as a result of inflation actually uh, increase in value and kind of create that wealth divide, you know, we're, we're just falling farther and farther yeah. behind. And, and sorry, it, you know what, I, like, I'm going to call it out. It makes me angry when you've got the, uh, you know, the guy at Bank of Canada to two, three years ago, three years ago, said, oh, no, no, rates are staying low. Go ahead, Canadians. You know, we're not going to raise rates. Go and buy. That's okay. Like, what kind of messaging is that? How is that okay that you're the, the head of the Bank of Canada, the governor of the Bank of Canada, and you're saying, no, 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 we're keeping rates low. Nobody, nobody projected at any point in any of the G7 countries when you're printing all this money or in the other central banks around the world. Hey, you know what? We've run some models. We've got some economists here. We've plugged in the numbers. This is the end point in 12, 24, 36 months. And you go out on TV and say, no, no, it's cool. We got you covered. And then the prime minister comes out and says, no, numbers aren't my thing. I'll just keep doing deficit spending while you're destroying our money. No, no, no. That's not cool. Seriously, stop. Like, it, it, it's not okay. And this is where we're at, right? This is what happens. So yeah, it just, it, it's frustrating because we all work harder. We're all risking our money. We're all putting our skin on the line and they get to print money and stay in power. Like, I, I'm not cool with that. So I've got to invest time learning about Bitcoin and investing in these hard assets. As Anthony said, precious metals, real estate, Bitcoin, uh, you know, fine art if you're you know, wealthy individual. But yeah, we got to yep. diversify. I, I think a lot of people get into Bitcoin uh, seeing it as almost like, a, you know, like an early company stock, right? Something that they're just hoping is going to blow up. And I think what, what needs to happen is you, you change your way of thinking instead of seeing it as this opportunity to get in early, th 
think of it just simply as a savings account, because if you're just holding cash and you understand that you are, <clears throat> excuse me, losing that purchasing power, well, then holding that cash in the bank is really not going to do you any good 20, 30 years down the road. Yeah, there was a time where that was like, that was a great strategy and you could earn yield just having a savings account, but that is not the case anymore. So you purchase Bitcoin, whatever you can afford, and it just becomes your savings vehicle. And over time, yeah, you're going to have that volatility, but as long as it keeps doing what it has been doing, um, and it ought to, because it's only going to get scarcer and scarcer, you know, over time, you're going to, you know, do well for yourself. Yeah. And I think um, any, any, and anyone listening, just to add to that, anyone listening here, your audience, even if it is, you know, just invest $50. Just try it out, like put, put your, you know, get your foot in, you know, your, your toe in the door and just go through the process of experiencing what it's like to buy $50 worth of Bitcoin on one of the exchanges. It really isn't as difficult as it sounds or has to be. So opening up an account, doing the e-transfer, done. And then of course, from there, you can get more sophisticated and talk about different storage options, but buy your first $50, learn about the history of money and expect, you know, that's going to be very volatile. But think of it as a savings 5, 10, 15 years, or as we say, hashtag for the kids, right? For the future, long-term, long-term generational wealth. Absolutely. Anthony, I'm going to turn this question over to you. Why do you think that adults kind of lack this financial literacy? Is, is it a lack of schooling? Is it um, some sort of cultural thing? Is it, is it the banks and the government having this huge sort of operation, if you will, where they're like intentionally you know, putting these messages out to, to sort of confuse us, to, to obfuscate some of the language? Um, or, you know, is it a mix of maybe all three? Sure. I, I think we are busy, right? You know, we're busy with school, we're busy with life, we're busy with family, busy with rep sports or hobbies. We're busy with distraction. Um, so I think, you know, not to dump and make the big heavy on everybody, we, we, we are busy. But I think the, re the reality that we're facing is that the change that's happening and the feeling that we are feeling just because we're feeling it the way we're feeling it now i think there is a rate of change that's happening that we need to appreciate so i i you know we feel i feel burdened you know sharing with my nieces and nephews in their 20s i feel burdened talking to my neighbors about it to my family to my friends to say guys you know Please look at, you're, you're feeling something too. I know you are because we talk about things. It's like, guys, you start investigating. You have to spend a little time to look at a, another option. That's, it's just required, right? We haven't been trained in this. We haven't, the definitions are, are given to us in a way that makes sense. I, truthfully, I, there, there was nobody I worked with in the bank that was a maniacal scheming person. And I worked with very senior people. You know, some of them were, you know, senior executives at the bank or in technology companies. I, I think there's a lot of us because we were all there, right? A lot of us just didn't understand how things were working. And it just, we have to understand we're the ones that are responsible for our families. We're the ones responsible for our, our money. And we have to try and figure out what, what is causing this problem? Why is our generation feeling, and I mean, we're, we're older, right? But why is it that our parents think it should be way easier for us and don't understand why it's a struggle for us? You must, you must be doing something wrong and spending too much money. That's what they think. And so just understanding that, that, distance between us and what our parents experience is, we should make sure that we try to figure this out because the distance between us and our kids, that gap is way bigger than we think it is. Um, and we have to try and figure it out. There's just, regardless of the reasoning now, because I can't point a finger, I, there's nobody, no real person I can actually point a finger to, because I think a lot of the people we'd like to point our fingers to may not actually even understand some of the things that we are starting to work it through but there are some answers out there and we do need to understand what inflation is like we do need to figure out how to to defend against this we do need to figure out how to invest our money and we do need to figure out ways to teach our kids um how to look at this and to understand how the money system works and the banks how banking works and how inflation works against you how interest rates compounding interest how budgeting we have to do this because it just doesn't happen that you just go to go to school and get a job and 
you know, save a little bit of money and buy it just that's that's not the easy path for everybody. So we have to figure out a different way. Yeah. And putting money in your mutual fund isn't going to work or your RSP. Um, and I just I caught a clip a couple of days ago of Safe and Dina Moose on a podcast. Very, I got to go back and listen to it again. But the summary was, listen, 100 years ago, you could get an ounce of gold or 10 ounces of gold. And, and that was it. Like it would hold its value and it would rise in value as, as, as uh, over time. Uh, today, you need to set up corporations and invest in stocks and do options trading and have all sorts of sophisticated tools and, and set up registered accounts. It's a full-time job. You need accountants, you need lawyers, you need tax specialists to help you out just to protect your money from devaluation. We need to become full-time economists to navigate through this. And that's wrong because the money system is broken. That's a really good point. It's like you have all these things where you're trying to hedge your bets and it isn't because you're trying to make this huge profit. It's literally just to at least survival. Money you have. It's yeah, survival. It's, that's a great <laughs> it's treading point. Water. And, it, and it just shows you how ridiculous it is. And I'm, I'm, I hate to say it, but I'm just so sick of hearing this narrative of like, oh, you know, your generation, you guys have so many things you can buy. It's the Netflix and the avocado toast. I mean, it, it's that like, that Freeland uh, speech where she said like, well, if you know, if you cancel your Disney plus, you'll be okay. Yeah. No, it's, my, it's, are you forgetting the fact that my rent is, you know, 60, 70% of my income? Like there are people now, like in, in any major city in, across Canada, and certainly I'm sure in the States it's similar where, you know, if you're a single person working your typical job, that that's not enough to cover rent along with everything else. You know, that, that old rule of, is it 50% for your needs, 30% for your wants, and 20% towards your debt and your savings? Like, that's just thrown out the window. That's just unrealistic. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, there, was, there was a tweet going around in July that you need, and again, I, I need to go back. You can look this up on Twitter. You've probably seen it, but $220,000 or 220000 income. I don't know if that was to purchase, like to own assuming that you had the down payment for a million plus home in Toronto or just the rent. It was, you know, I, I recall it for, for ownership, Mark. Okay. So that was like 20, 220, 230. It was, it was just in the yeah. star too, right? For yeah. that. And, and that, and that's, that's having accurate. the down payment. <laughs> that's having the down payment and that's doing a very small savings at the end of the day. Very small. Um, yeah. It's, it's frustrating. I remember like we lived in, my wife and I lived in Vancouver for three years going back about 12 years ago. And at the time, I believe home ownership in Vancouver was approximately 58% of your income, home ownership in Vancouver. But if you're saying today that it's 60 plus percent in Toronto just to rent, it shows you how messed up things are even in the past 10 years. So it is oh, tough. Yeah. It's tough for young it people. It affects everyone. Yeah, I actually charted it. I just looked up a bunch of numbers and like the average one bedroom apartment in Toronto, um, sort of across the city uh, in, over the last eight years has gone up 105%. Like it's just ludicrous. And it's not like places are getting any larger. It's not like they're getting any better. It's just our dollars just getting that much weaker. And, and that's what okay. people need to understand is that like our money is broken. Um, and for anybody out there that likes to read, uh, Lynn Alden just put out her book, Broken Money. I, I definitely recommend you go out and check that. Um, yeah, it's just, we live Great in a economist. Weird, broken system. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Mark, uh, I guess I'll turn this one to you and then Anthony, I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, sure. And I'm sure this is some of the stuff you guys, you know, tell, tell people all the time, what can parents do, or perhaps like, what is something they should say to their children to, to kind of help them navigate this new world that we're living in? Great question. Um, I, actually, Anthony and I just caught a tweet last month where 72% of Canadian parents are concerned about their kids' financial future specifically. So approximately 72, 75% were worried that they couldn't even create a budget. And this, this came out as a TD survey. Um, I, I think as a dad and sitting down with my wife, just having conversations with your kids about money, I know it's it sounds very uh, sort of you know anecdotal and, and nothing concrete, but Maybe if, if you're a parent out there trying to figure out the history of money, you want to learn about the gold standard, what happened in 1971 to 72 under Nixon, uh, what Bitcoin is, what's the difference between Bitcoin and crypto? Maybe the family on Friday night, dedicate 15, 20 minutes to listen to a podcast, to watch a YouTube video, uh, to start get you know, jump onto Twitter and, and follow individuals like Lynn Alden 
and learning about the history of money. And these are all like, these are all concrete facts that are being shared um, and sit down as a family. I think there's some great resources, um, none of which come to mind right now or any books or so, but uh, there, I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's fantastic resources out there if, if you can find them or just individuals like on Twitter or blogs, but I think dedicate, dedicate time, talk to your kids, even if it's just explaining what money is like there's debit, you're taking it out of an account, you've got to spend it kids, you know, my, my kids, I'll give you an example. Uh, we're in St. Augustine last two weeks ago. It's the, actually the oldest city in America founded in 1565 with the Spaniards. They had a base there, a uh, really cool city. Beautiful. And we, um, we went to, a, it was just myself and my two boys and we went to a nice restaurant. It started raining. So we probably ended up on the nicest restaurant in that area, the most expensive restaurant. And uh, my son wanted the $48 prime rib. I'm like, no, 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 buddy. Come on. Like the, you don't get a rack of ribs and prime rib and steak. Every time we go out, we're talking 48 us, you know, on a, on a road trip. So I was like, you got to understand, have these conversations and say, like, this is expensive. You factor in inflation, right? Uh, sorry, not inflation, uh, the exchange rate. You're looking at, you know, a 35% premium on that. So have these conversations. And I think in a society where everything is instant gratification, especially for kids with their TikTok and their phones and Uber Eats, say, hey, somebody's got to earn this money, right? It takes time and energy and effort. So anyways, I'll, I'll let Anthony continue. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think there's a it's it's an it's important for us to um, I think it's important for us to be able to spend time doing that with our kids. One is like if there are books that we've read, um, we've got Price of Tomorrow, Jeff Booth, or the Bitcoin Standard, Safe Dean, you know, uh, Jim Rickards, the the New Case for Gold, um, you know. Rich dad, poor dad, you know, this is where all the entrepreneurs kind of first or the real estate investors, they, they get these little books. These are books that, you know, I've passed to my kids. Okay, guys, because they're old, mine are older than yours. So, um, but, you know, it's okay, guys, you got to read this book. Okay, read this book. Okay, read this book. And we'll sit and we'll make time to try and talk about things. Um, it's great that we're doing some of the things in school, like making a budget. But, you know, as my kids were preparing for school, I, you know, create a spreadsheet and walk them through and teach them how to use a budget and go year by year at the next year at university, do that sort of thing. That's the kind of stuff that we, we do need to, we need, we do need to do. We do need to do it for our family. We do need to do it with and for our kids to teach them how to do that and then supplement it. Like I said, supplement it with the books, but we're, we're trying to create a way for parents to be able to have some support outside of the home to kind of reinforce some of the messages that they have for their kids too. And as, as teenagers, right. So these are important things and uh, yeah, everything we can do. I, I think if you're, if you're a parent looking for some ways to start engaging your kids, talk about compound interest, talk about the power of compound interest, how money can grow delayed gratification. Hey, have you invested a hundred dollars? Like that's what I do with my students in class. And they're amazed with the numbers and you just plug it into a calculator. Hey, if you're 17 today, if you were to work at this part-time job and save all your money and you end up saving $20,000 over the next three years, what's the value of it based at 8%, 9%? You know, of course there's inflation, but what would it be worth when you're 50 in 30 years? Uh, the other thing is the rule of 72. How long does it take for your money to double? So you start thinking about, wow, like if I invest at 4%, it's going to take this long for my money to double. If I can get a yield, maybe through private mortgages at 10, 12%, oh my God, it's going to take this amount of time to double. The other thing is that there's a great series by, uh, uh, series on YouTube. It's Mike, Mike Malone. Mike Maloney, um, I think it is. Mike Maloney, fantastic. It's, it's a little dated. It's about 10 years old, but he's got a six, seven, eight part series because he keeps adding on the history of gold. This is before Bitcoin. Although I noticed he did add a video recently on Bitcoin. That's a great series because it goes all the way back to Egypt and ancient Greece and the Romans. Uh, well it talks done. about, yeah, really well done. Yeah. Great research. Uh, so definitely worth your time. Yeah. Yeah. That was one that I saw uh, that even opened up my eyes to certain things. I should put that one in the show notes because definitely we're checking out. Um, yeah. I think he's uh, probably more of a gold bug than, and into Bitcoin. In fact, I, I think there's a, a crypto that he sort of shills a little bit. So <laughs> just, just be mindful of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, he he understands what money is. He, he advocates for sound money. So definitely something we're checking out. Um, Anthony, like, you know, if, if you had to give, let's say one, maybe two reasons 
Why would you say that Bitcoin is valuable? Why is it important? Something that people need to stop ignoring, but recognize as like potentially game changing. Yeah, I think in, in the context of for kids, I think the out of all the things that I've seen investable assets, this is an investment advice, but I'm just I'm just saying for me and for our family, out of all the types of assets that I see in the characteristics um, of good money, um, the the benefits of something called like a network effect as people come on and supply and demand, which we learned in economics and the impact of those, like, those things, I think there's so much wound up into um, how Bitcoin works, security, supply. Um, it, there's so many things that are wrapped up into that. It makes it look like over time, as more people come and appreciate its its um, its characteristics and try to buy some for themselves, that it has a chance to actually um, uh, increase in value just by demand, as well as increase in the value because we know that more and more money needs to be printed because that's the way the money system works today. So those two drivers, demand, uh, supply, uh, I guess the other driver would just be um, um, the amount of money that gets printed to devalue it. Those two plus the one, three drivers are things that get behind increasing the, the, val the dollar value of Bitcoin going forward in a way that nothing else I've seen does. And so when, when you're hearing things like that, when you hear things like BlackRock coming in and all of these um, like $27 trillion worth of money managers are saying now we need to look to try and create an EFT to, um, to, to be able to sell that as an investment to the, their, their customers. These are things that, these are the reasons why we came on to Bitcoin now, but the, when we're hearing it, we're saying, oh, wow. Money managers are now saying it. They're writing reports saying that stuff is going to grow like crazy and that you need to allocate something um, that's in your investment portfolio to this for, to outsize your returns, like you can get increased returns on the rest of your portfolio when it's all together. There are so many different layers of why Bitcoin seems to be something that you have to explore if you're not currently exploring it. It's just worth exploring it. When they're doing that and others are doing it, you have to look at it and allocate to it. Um, for our kids, if this actually ends up being something that moves and accelerates and grows at an exponential rate um, and get from adoption, like allocating a little bit to it has such a great potential to be a bigger number later on that there is, what else could they possibly invest in that could do that thing? And so for that reason, I have our kids, my kids looking into having a, a, a reasonable allocation for them for themselves to have a part of the Bitcoin network, to have some, not even whole Bitcoins, we're not talking about that. You're able to buy fractions of it. So get some of it so that it, you're positioned to have, to, to benefit from it over time. And uh, I, I can't encourage that enough for kids for those types of reasons. I'm glad you brought up the fact that you don't have to own a whole Bitcoin. You can you can buy one one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin. Uh, did you want to add to that, Mark? Just just I mean, you did a great job, Anthony. But again, Bitcoin's got no CEO, no central banker. It's completely decentralized. You there's a set of rules. This is how it works. The protocol won't change, and you can see exactly how much Bitcoin there is in an open ledger. Completely transparent. And finally, it's finite. There's 21 million Bitcoin. That's it. If you understand the history of money and understand what hard money is, it's appealing. It's appealing to me. And as Anthony said, and as you you say as well, Milan, like it doesn't have to be an entire Bitcoin, but have some money invested in Bitcoin. I think it's important. And then, of course, you can make your decisions down the road. Again, this isn't financial advice. This is what I'm doing. I know this is what Anthony is doing as well. But have some exposure to it. Why not? Uh, Mark, you know, I teach uh, mostly kids that are kindergarten up to grade six, and it's funny how many of them actually, I mean, I don't know what they know about Bitcoin, but they're familiar with it. Like I sometimes wear a Bitcoin sweater to work and I get kids I'm that the are same. like, hey, Bitcoin. So yeah. <laughs> um, there's probably it's... the influencers on YouTube and, and they're sure. seeing this, but I, I yeah, sorry, if, it's the same thing. I wear some Bitcoin t-shirts and they love it. And these are older kids and they're, it definitely it resonates with them, which is really important. Well, I was going to ask you, so with like, you know, kids at the grade seven, grade eight level, 
Um, is there anything you do to kind of educate them about Bitcoin uh, specifically? Well, in math classes, instead of teaching directly from the textbook, you can teach about interest, for example, or price change by plugging it into stocks or Bitcoin and saying, wow, like this was the price of Bitcoin in 2010. This is the price of Bitcoin at its peak in 2021. And what's the percentage change? Let's run a calculation using Bitcoin. And then it, the kids will, will, will do that. And it's like, it was like the best performing asset over the past 10 years or since 2009. Um, the other thing is um, you just talk about the history of Bitcoin and they love it. It resonates with them, you know, transition time, like Satoshi Nakamoto. They love that name. They think it's cool. Like the pseudo name, who is this individual? Um, then kids are into technology with the whole open ledger and the blockchain. Uh, so there's, there's huge interest. Why not? Why not talk to them about it? Right. It's a great, great set, you know, intro into Bitcoin. And then again, I'll talk to them and I'll be open about it. I'm like, look, there's a difference between crypto and Bitcoin. Here's the difference. And you start talking about that. Awesome. Anthony, I know you said that you're essentially you're getting your kids into it. Um, is there any sort of other educational piece to what you're doing? Uh, maybe to, to neighbors, friends of yours? Yeah, no, I just, just, you know, as someone who cares about, and um, as someone who cares to interact with my kids, friends and we've done that forever they're just nice nice people to have around our house i take opportunities to talk just to try and pour into their lives and whatever they're thinking about if it's what school pro what kind of university program to get into what kind of um what kind of job markets to look at what's happening in the economy what are you thinking about hey i heard you that you guys got an investment account on well simple so what are you putting your stuff into how's that working how does that have you guys ever thought about this and you just see different types of ideas and thoughts different messages for them to consider so that you know their minds become open and they learn and grow just through the opportunities to us for us to interact i think that's that's a good that's a good service that's a good community service thing to do right care for your neighbor what would i want someone to do and share with me and what would i have wanted someone to do and share with me five years ago ten years ago 15 years ago, 30 years ago. That's what I'm trying to, that's what Mark and I are trying to do. Share yeah. with what, share with them the things that we've learned through some of its hard knocks, some of it's through hundreds of hours of research. Um, some of it, and that's partly just who, how we're geared up. Not everybody's going to want to do that. And you don't have to do hundreds of hours of research. There are summaries online. There are little reports that you can read. You can read one book that summarizes and collapses it with the Bitcoin standard. Or if you're interested in technology, the price of tomorrow, there are so many little things that you could do, like one little step that will go, oh my goodness, okay, well, there's something to that. It's just not a bunch of yahoos, right? And crazies. No, no. Think about it and learn. And I want I want to share that with our kids and with our program, just make that available to them too, just to support families, right? Awesome. You know, when you were listing uh, some of those books earlier, made me think like perhaps one idea that people might want to do is like, you know, if, if you're in a book club, Maybe you're thinking of starting a book club, you know, forget the novels, you know, the narratives that you typically read, like, why not use some books on economics and Bitcoin specifically? Um, because like, what better way to start understanding some of the stuff, but to really have a, like an open dialogue about it, because there's a good chance that like, you know, you open up uh, Jeff Booth's book and you're like, I don't really understand this. But once you start to really hash it out with two, three, four people, it's like, oh, OK, I start sort of diving down that rabbit hole and really exploring those things getting to actually understand them. So, um, yeah, it just came to me. I, I think it'd be a great idea. I mean, it's not going to necessarily I, interest everybody, but. Yeah, I think yeah, a fantastic book is like an intro book um, that I really enjoyed is the bullish case for Bitcoin. Hmm. Bullish case yeah. for Bitcoin. I really, that one really resonated with me after having read the Bitcoin standard and magic internet money. Um, it really just in very succinctly summarizes what Bitcoin is and the bullish case for it. Great book. That's yeah, a great one. Yeah, I'm hoping to get VJ on here. He told me yeah. to reach out to him in September, so I'm definitely going to cool. do that. Nice. Uh, guys, thank, thank you so much for being on here. Um, I want to give you guys a chance to kind of talk a little bit about what you're doing. So, uh, Mark, why don't we start with you? Yeah. So, Anthony and I have teamed up together, and we just want to share our passion and enthusiasm, as we had shared with you during this podcast, teaching kids. We know there's a demand. We know parents want their children to learn about financial literacy as a teacher. We know that there's great interest in this topic. So we've put together a course for kids. We actually have some dates coming up. We've got a um, 
full day session. These are all full days. We sit down with the kids, small group interaction. Um, we not only do we obviously teach them and talk to them, but we get them involved in this course where they get to understand what money is, the history of money. We take them all the way through to Bitcoin. And then we also share with them what a budget is. And they actually create their own budget. We give them the tools and they go out and create a budget and figure out how much rent's going to be, how much do they need to save? Okay, now you've got a little bit of discretionary. Don't forget you've got internet and cell phone and you want to hang out with your friends. And hey, if you want to buy new sneakers or jeans, this is what you're going to have to save. So we also have them budget in the afternoon. And then we bring them back together. And as the parents come back in, the kids actually do a short presentation and teach their parents the history of money. Uh, nice. What are good assets? What are hard assets? What is inflation? What's the basement of money? What's Bitcoin? And then, of course, they can present their budget as well. So we ran that successfully back in February and April. We actually sold out the space. We capped it off. And we've got three dates if parents are interested. We've got three dates coming up, scheduled for 2022-23. That's October 20th. It's a Saturday. November 18th. That's also a Saturday. And we have a 2023 date early, uh, 2023, January 27th. These events are taking place in person uh, in Mississauga, South Mississauga. So if you do have you know, any interest or if anyone would like to learn more, reach out to Anthony or I. It's over at finliteracy.ca. That's F-I-N literacy.ca. So you can check us out there. Anthony, is there anything else? Yeah, Mark, you, you got you got, you covered the waterfront there. That's awesome. Here's here's what the here's where the magic is for kids, young kids and adults, the same thing too. So much happens when people of like-minded, uh, like interested people get together and see that they're not alone. And you know, the way you facilitate the course, Mark, and having the kids work together in teams and in groups and share what they're thinking, asking questions in a safe place to do it yeah. with other teens. It's remarkable how, how engaged they are and how much they learn and how much it's, it's fun. I mean, I would have had a blast. Now. I would have had a blast back in the day if that was something for me, but it's great to see it in a room where kids are just actually learning something because they know it's in their best interest to figure out money and how it works because they see their, their present and their future ahead of them. And who doesn't want to have an advantage and learn this early? The kids realize that everybody wants an advantage and uh, a head start. And that's what this is all about, giving kids a head start by having some increased financial literacy in a fun way. Awesome. Anthony, if people want to find you uh, online, where can they look? Yeah, I'm on Twitter. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. So Anthony DeGaz on or DeGaz on Anthony, you just Google that there's only not too many DeGaz ons in this world. And uh, so you'll, you, you can be able to see us there. You know, certainly, we're, we're about in enriching the lives of kids. So it's child enrichment. This is the way we're doing it financially. Our my other core business, I do it with at go.degazonmusic.ca. Mark also has a tutoring business as well to help enrich kids um, with making helping them be more capable from a, an academic standpoint and a great firm foundation. So there's lots of different ways we're trying to meet kids' needs and families' needs to get them set up right early strong foundation and uh, just happy to help it everywhere we can cool and mark uh, where can people find you online at molder mark that's the twitter that's my handle we also have a, a bitcoin handle on instagram it's at btc kids btc kids and my tutoring website is brightlightlearning.ca brightlightlearning.ca awesome. that's it it was it was a pleasure having you guys on and hopefully you know some of the listeners out there if you Kind of been thinking like what can i do to kind of help educate my kids you know, i think we've given you some strategies and uh i mean we don't have all the answers or we certainly haven't come up with all the answers so start you know thinking outside the box think of resources that are more applicable to you like uh sometimes when i put my daughter down uh, for bed she's she's five years old we read good night bitcoin it's a take on good night moon and uh awesome. you know we, we have a blast so yeah any, anything you can do to, to essentially like these guys said you know enrich your child's uh children's lives um and, and getting to understand what money is, I, I certainly advocate for it. So yeah, thanks again, you guys. Hey, thanks a lot. Pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. Really appreciate it, buddy.